Let's talk about the thyroid and getting pregnant, what you need to know. Hi friends, I am Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and fertility doctor. Okay, so let's dive into two main topics, thyroid gland and pregnancy and those trying to get pregnant. In pregnancy, one thing we know is that there is an increase in estrogen and an increase in that pregnancy hormone HCG, and these both change the synthesis of thyroid hormone receptors. And essentially what happens is that you have a greater need for thyroid hormone in early pregnancy, and so a lower therapeutic range of your TSH. So if you check a TSH level in somebody in the first trimester of pregnancy, we want it to be less than 2.5, so not that 4.5 number. This has been extrapolated to infertility data, and so we feel the same way in our patients trying to conceive. The fetus begins to make thyroid hormones around 11 weeks, but it's not fully functional till closer to 20. So in this early fetal development, brain development is dependent on enough thyroid hormone, and that all comes from mom. So you will hear me and other endocrinologists always say, I'd rather you be a little over-treated versus under-treated, because having extra circulating thyroid hormone in the form of a pill that you take means that there's enough circulating around to get to the baby. Typically, really serious hypothyroidism, like super high TSH levels, is not found in pregnancy because of those menstrual abnormalities. You're not ovulating. Remember, the pituitary gland where TSH is made is also what makes FSH and LH, which control ovulation. So if your pituitary gland is really busy making a lot of TSH, it is not making the others as well. But if you're not ovulating, you're unlikely to get pregnant. However, there are pregnancy complications when it comes to being hypothyroid, and some of those include infertility, miscarriage, preeclampsia or high blood pressure of pregnancy, growth restriction, preterm birth, abnormal fetal brain development, increase in fetal death, and lower IQ. So treatment guidelines are if you've diagnosed somebody with hypothyroidism in early pregnancy, you want to get their TSH less than 2.5, start them on a higher dose of synthetic thyroid hormone, and you check them really frequently to make sure of this. Hyperthyroidism is much less common in the same way typically people with very serious hyperthyroidism are not getting pregnant because of menstrual changes. However, this can also cause preeclampsia, congestive heart failure, growth restriction, thyroid disease in the baby, congestive heart failure of the baby, tachycardia or arrhythmias of the baby, something called hydrops, which is a really devastating complete swelling of the skin of the baby and fetal demise. All of these are outcomes that we don't want to see. So there's very specific treatment guidelines if you're starting medications about what you should be on, what you should measure, and what fetal testing you need. So if you know you have hyperthyroidism, please talk to your endocrinologist before you want to get pregnant. Thyroid hormone and infertility. I'm going to go over a few studies. One was published in Fertility and Sterility in 2000. It just looked at menstrual abnormalities in people who were hypo or hypothyroid and found that 20 to 25% of those people had menstrual changes. So that is a serious symptom. So if you have irregular periods on your immediate diagnostic list should be ruled out thyroid disease. Another study, and there have been a lot looking at this, this one was published in 2006 in JCEM, was looking at pregnancy loss and thyroid disease. This study showed us a higher miscarriage rate than patients who had thyroid antibodies, so autoimmune thyroid disease Hashimoto's that were not treated with thyroid hormone versus patients who were. So this study was the first one showing us that if we treated somebody who had thyroid antibodies, we saw a reduction in miscarriage rate and a reduction in preterm birth rate. This is why some people treat those who have a positive TPO antibody with thyroid hormone, regardless of what their TSH is. A newer study, which just came out in the Green Journal, tried to look at this as well. It looked at 187 women who had positive TPO antibodies and randomized them to treatment or not, and they did not see a reduction in live birth. A big caveat with this study, even though it is the newest one we have to date and is suggesting that we may not need to treat these people, you know, the average TSH in both groups was less than 2.5, or does this not answer the question of maybe there's something else with your antibody positive, such as inflammation or other autoimmunity that's causing this pregnancy loss. So, this is an unknown. Your doctor is right or wrong to treat you with thyroid hormone if you have positive thyroid antibodies, regardless of your TSH. So it's a question. We have seen a study, it was in 2010, looking at patients who had subclinical hypothyroidism, so that TSH value of 2.5 that we use in the first trimester, people who had a TSH less than 2.5 had a lower incidence of pregnancy loss than those with a TSH of higher than 2.5. So I always tell my patients, Natalie walking around planet Earth who has a TSH of 3.4 is no big deal. 
Natalie who's trying to get pregnant or already pregnant with a TSH of 3.4, that one should be treated. And that's pretty standard of care to screen somebody with infertility or who has abnormal periods, irregular cycles with a TSH, and make sure that we're getting it into that less than 2.5 state. In a study looking at IVF cycles and thyroid, we saw lower pregnancy rates in patients who had TSH levels of higher than 2.5 and in patients who had positive antibodies. So certainly something may be playing a role here. In another study published in Fertility and Sterility looking at IVF cycles, if you were treated or not, your TSH was lower or higher than 2.5. We did not see differences in eggs retrieved or clinical pregnancy rate, but we did see a difference in live birth rate, so miscarriage rate. Therefore, personally, patients who have an abnormal TSH, I'll let them go through and make embryos, but then I have a hard stop before we do the embryo transfer of making sure your thyroid is more controlled. So a couple summary points about infertility, and then I'm going to tell you why this is controversial, is that hypo and hyperthyroidism can cause abnormal cycles. If you have abnormal periods, you definitely should get screened with a TSH. It appears that hypothyroidism or subclinical having a TSH of higher than 2.5 is associated with pregnancy loss. Therefore, patients in the first trimester should have a TSH of less than 2.5 or those who have infertility should consider being screened. We should consider screening for CPO antibodies if there's other autoimmune disease, these are those Hashimoto's antibodies, or if we have recurrent pregnancy loss without an etiology, although treatment of this is controversial. There's a lot of debate on if you should screen for thyroid disease, whether it's in the first trimester or somebody who has infertility, and our different professional organizations actually feel differently about this. Here is a slide of some society screening guidelines, and this will kind of drive home my take-home message. ACOG, which is the um, American College of OBGYN, does not have any recommendation for screening except for high-risk screening during pregnancy. So if you have prior family member symptoms, you're high risk for thyroid disease. However, the Endocrine Society, American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, and the American Thyroid Association all say something different. They don't recommend universal preconception screening, but they do recommend high-risk preconception screening, and they have very specific treatment guidelines, like I said, based on the trimester. Now, the Endocrine Society says you should screen at preconception visit, so you want to get pregnant at a new OB visit if you have any of the following risk factors. And so I want you just to listen to these real quickly. You're over 30. You have any family history of thyroid disease. You have a goiter or a mass in your thyroid gland. You have history of positive autoimmunity. Do you have any symptom of thyroid dysfunction? So remember, fatigue, menstrual changes, infertility, sweating, palpitations, any of those symptoms I said at the beginning, that counts. You have infertility, you have a history of a miscarriage, history of a preterm birth, you live in a region with iodine deficiency, or you've ever had head neck radiation. So right away, when I look at my patients, people who are over 30, family history, infertility, prior preterm birth or miscarriage, or irregular cycles, that's my patients. That's all of them. And this is why we check a thyroid hormones on everybody. Most fertility clinics will because our patient population falls into high risk preconception screening. Last note is that the recommended dose is 1.5 micrograms per kilogram per day of thyroid hormone. So sometimes they see somebody put somebody on a baby dose like 25 micrograms or 50 micrograms. And if you truly are falling above a TSH of 2.5 before conception or in the first trimester, you should be on weight-based dosing. The dosing if you're pregnant is actually 2.2 micrograms per kilograms per day. So even higher than this. So for my pregnant patients, if they're already on a dose, you can increase them by 30% or about two extra taps per week while you follow levels and adjust. What is controversial is what you do in the setting of positive thyroid autoimmunity with a normal or a TSH less than 2.5. We don't have that question answered. If your TSH is over 2.5, you should already be treated based on prior guidelines, right? But if you have positive thyroids with history of pregnancy loss and your TSH is less than 2.5, is there a benefit to treating? Literature is mixed and that's what you need to understand. Most recent literature suggests no. However, the treatment for hypothyroidism in that context is relatively low risk. So treatment with Synthroid or Levothyroxine because we prefer you to be over-treated and have extra thyroid hormones. So potential benefit, low risk, inexpensive treatment, that I usually treat, although this is an open discussion with your doctor and both choices are fine. Overall, I hope this helps you understand a little bit about basic thyroid physiology, what is hypo and hyperthyroidism, how they intersect with your periods, miscarriage, infertility, and pregnancy, and answer some of your basic questions. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD for more. Thanks, friends.